with the song that was just played. Thank you. Please find your seats. The cattle are no longer lowing. If I could invite my worship team to come up, we'd like to begin. I'd like to welcome you to Palisadro's church. We are also included, including members from the, our sister church in Reading. I'd like you to see Stephanie, a dad, who will be having our children's story as well, and her mom, Linda. This first song that we are going to sing is a favorite of my grandsons, especially the chorus. Please join us to sing this song. Come, O Come, Emmanuel. It's a beautiful song. Just know that there is a bit of an interlude between each stanza. Captain. 
Good morning. How many of you are rejoicing in your hearts this morning? This is time of the year when minds are brought more towards Jesus Christ. A lot of times during the rest of the year, folks don't think about it too much, except maybe those of us who come here every week to praise him. But it's a special time when you can talk to neighbors and friends about the real meaning of Christmas. And uh, I'd like to have my elders come up. All the current elders in the church, please come up front. This is the time of prayer. We're going to have some prayer. If you are currently an elder, please come up front. A lot of times in general congregation, uh, it's real easy to miss who the elders are. And I like to keep these people up front because <laughs> they're good folks, every one of them put a lot of time into trying to trying to help with the church. Now, I'd like to have everyone who is a volunteer in any capacity, from those uh, uh, doing the book work, those doing the teaching, those uh, carrying out the trash, anything. If you are a volunteer in this church, currently active, please stand up. I know some of you are not saying, come on. If you are currently an active volunteer in this church, any capacity, if you work down when the, during the, uh, that would include your, your deaconesses, your deacons, I mean, if, if you're, okay. I think some people are bashful to stand up. I know there's a lot more involved. I would like to say, the elders would like to say, thank you, thank you for volunteering. It's a lot of effort. A lot of things behind the scenes. I know the PA, these guys are out here continually uh, when programs are going on. The only time most people notice PA committee is when something goes wrong. They're determining what's happening. The truth is a lot of work goes. A lot of teachers put a lot of work into their lessons. A lot of individuals are doing much more than is recognized. And this time of year, I'd just like to thank you guys. Thank you for stepping forward. And for those who are not currently volunteering, next year we're going to ask the same thing. We expect you to be standing up too. The Lord has put you in this church because he has a place for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we pray now? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love to us. The ultimate gift was from you. And we thank you, Lord, for, that, for the mercy, for the kindness. We pray, Father, that that as we are witnesses for you in this world, that you would help us to carry forth your bidding. Lord, there are so many things that go on that uh, to be frustrating, cause us not to, to feel your closeness, cause us to believe sometimes that maybe you're not working. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us where we failed you. And we praise you that you don't give up on us, you hang in there, you keep working with us, you keep loving. Thank you for Jesus in this time of year when it is represented that he came to this earth. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. And thanks for all the volunteers, Lord, that are working in this church to help carry forward your work. We praise you today in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture this morning is from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good joy. I mean, no. 
I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. Let's sing together about that Savior. It's number 127 in the hymnal, Infant Holy, Infant Lowly.
Time for a children's story. If all the children want to come up front, join me. Okay, good morning, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, welcome. All right, who can tell me how many days is it till Christmas? Do you know? Um, eight. Eight? I think almost. Do you know? Eight. Eight? I think it's between eight and seven. Somebody, an adult know? Somewhere around there. It's really close. Between eight and I think so. All right, who can tell me what is the most important, what, what does Christmas mean to you? God came to save this world from sin. That's a really good thing. What else does Christmas mean to you? Same. Same. That's a good answer, huh? That he come to die for us on the cross. Yes. All right. What about for you? Share. Sharing. Sharing is a really good thing. At Christmas time, we want to share. Yes. How about you? Spending time with your family. Exactly. Spending time with family. <gasps> you want to come back here? The story's over here. <laughs> All right. We're going to have some cool things. For me, too, spending time with family is a really important thing. Sometimes it's something we can take for granted. Did you know this is my first time back home in four years for Christmas? I haven't had a Christmas at home in four years, so I'm really thankful to be with my family for Christmas. I'm going to tell you a story. When I was 11, anybody 11 here? Close? Maybe you're still sitting back there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I was 11. When I was 11, we went with my family to the country far away called Peru. Does anybody know where Peru is? What continent? Do you know? South America. Job. Peru is, yes. Right next to Brazil. It's close to Brazil. Kind of on the other side of South America, but really close. Peru, do you know what language they speak? Sp yeah, they speak, I heard. Spanish? Exactly, they speak Spanish. So we went, you knew that too? Good job. We went to the country of Peru all together with my family and my grandma too. And we went on an airplane, and it was during Christmas time. And we went to build a church with Maranatha. And we went, and a lot of people were poor, but they were so happy to have us there to help them to have a church to worship in. And on Christmas Day, do you know what we did? We got up really early, and we got in a big bus, and we went a long way. It felt like a really long way. And we went to a lake. It had a really funny name. Do you know the name? It was called Lake Titicaca. It's 
Sounds like a funny name, huh? But on that island, uh, sorry, on that lake, there were floating islands. Did you know that people live on floating islands there? They have houses there. Do you think it'd be hard to have a really big house on a floating island? Yeah, they had small houses made out of huts, made out of reeds, and they lived there quite happily. Okay, I need a volunteer. Can somebody come up and help me? Oh, goodness, so many volunteers. Okay, I would like, can you come and help me? Thank you. All right, can you reach in this bag and find, can you find something? That's a good thing, perfect. All right, what do you think that is? Wheat. It's made out, yeah? What do you think? Wheat. Wheat? Yeah, it's kind of like made out of wheat. It's kind of made out of reeds. I'm sure it's a boat. You're right. It's what? Boat. A boat. Yes, it's a boat made out of reeds. Did you know? Thank you. All right, you can come sit back down. This is a boat made out of reeds. And they actually made big life-size ones. And they used those on the flo on, to get between the floating islands on Lake Titicaca in Peru. And when we went out there, they came out on these boats and they met us and they were playing instruments and they were singing and playing music because they were so happy to have us there for Christmas Day. Do you know what else was special about that Christmas Day? It was a Sabbath, just like today is. It was a Sabbath and they came and there was an Adventist church out there on, that, on one of the islands and we went and met them and they came and met us on these floating boats. Okay, I need another volunteer. So many volunteers, huh? Okay, um, can you come up? Thank you. All right, can you pull something else out of here? Woohoo! Oh, you gotta get one of those. There you go. Oh, you gotta turn her over. What's that? Um, a doll. A doll. This is a Peruvian doll. Thank you very much. All right, this is a Peruvian doll. And on the floating islands, this is kind of what they looked like. They had beautiful woolen dresses. They had their babies wrapped on their backs. And they, some of the instruments they had was a pan flute here. And they played. There's their little baby, you see? Look, they have two babies. You have a pan flute? Very cool. So on the islands, whoops, while we were there, the people, what I noticed, the people there were so joyful. Do you think they had a lot? Did they have a lot of toys? No. Did they have a big house? Opposite. No, probably not opposite, huh? But do you think they were sad? No, they won't. They were opposite, huh? They were really happy, and they were joyful, and they were singing songs to God, and they had, what do you think they had in their hearts? Jesus. Jesus. What else do you think they had in their hearts? Love. Love. Yes. Good job. And today's sermon, the pastor is going to talk about love. How at Christmas time, we can have love in our hearts. Even if we might not have a lot of things or toys, but we can have love in our hearts. And we can share that love, just like those Peruvian people on the island shared love with us through joy, through their smiles and kindness. And we can do that too. Thank you so much. You may go back to your seats. I got a new tie for Christmas. <laughs> but it's a special tie. Can you hear it? Someone from this congregation gave me this tie. That's why I'm wearing it. That's the only reason I'm wearing it. Is because when someone gives you a gift, if you don't put it on, then you really haven't accepted the gift. So. I'm wearing this in honor of the person who gave, and I'm looking for that person because I was going to call him out. <laughs> Thank you very much for this wonderful Christmas gift. <clears throat> now, I have two announcements that failed to get properly communicated. One of them was my fault. They're both my fault. We are having a funeral this afternoon for Arthur Griffiths at 4 o'clock. It didn't make it into the bulletin. I want to make sure you know. 4 o'clock here, we will be having a funeral service for him and you're all invited to attend. The other is 
Penny had asked me yesterday to make an announcement and I totally went brain dead. She needs some people to volunteer to deliver packages for the um, uh, angel tree. She has a few left. She needs you after church to stop out and see her. They have all the packages and everything. She just needs some delivered. So if you could see her right after church, she really would appreciate help in getting those delivered. <clears throat> Sophie, did you want to help me read this story? She seems to be quite talkative today. <clears throat> um, you know, cr doing Christmas services, especially preaching, is always tough because it's, it's coming up with something creative and new. It's kind of difficult at times. So I pulled this out of my old uh, file, and it's a story. I think I had done this years ago, and um, I wanted to read it to you. So <clears throat> the W in Christmas. Each December, I vowed to make Christmas a calm and peaceful experience. I had cut back on non-essential obligations, such as extensive card writing, endless baking, decorating, and even overspending. Yet still, I found myself exhausted, unable to appreciate the precious family moments and, of course, the true meaning of Christmas. My son, Nicholas, was in kindergarten, that year. It was an exciting season for a six-year-old. For weeks, he had been memorizing song for his school's winter pageant. I didn't have the heart to tell him I'd be working the night of the production. Unwilling to miss his shining moment, I spoke with his teacher, and she assured me that there'd be a dress rehearsal the morning of the presentation. All parents unable to attend that evening were welcome to come. Fortunately, Nicholas seemed happy with the compromise. So the morning of dress rehearsal, I filed in 10 minutes early and found a spot on the cafeteria floor and sat down quietly. Around the room, I saw several other pa parents quietly scampering to their seats. As I waited, the students were led into the room, each class accompanied by their teacher, sitting cross-legged on the floor. Then each group, group rose one by one to perform their song. Because the public school system had long stopped referring to the holiday as Christmas, I didn't expect anything other than fun commercial entertainment. Songs of reindeer and Santa Claus, snowflakes and good cheer. So when my son's class rose to sing Christmas Love, I was slightly taken aback by the bold title. Nicholas was all aglow, as were all of his classmates, adorned in fuzzy mittens and red sweaters and bright snow caps upon their heads. Those in the front row, center stage, held up large letters, one by one, to spell out the title of the song. As the class would sing, C is for Christmas, a child would hold up the letter C. Then H is for happy, and on and on and on, until each child holding up his portion had presented the complete message, Christmas love. The performance was going smoothly until suddenly we noticed a small, quiet girl in the front row holding the letter M upside down. Totally unaware, her M appeared as a W. The audience of first through sixth graders snickered at this little one's mistake, but she had no idea they were laughing at her, so she stood tall, proudly holding her W. Although many teachers tried to shush the children, the laughter continued until the last letter was raised and we saw it all together. A hush came over the audience and eyes began to widen. In that instant, we understood the reason we were there, why we celebrated the holiday in the first place, why even in the chaos there was purpose for our festivities. For when the last letter was held high, the message read loud and clear, Christ was love. So now you remember the W in Christmas. In Luke 2.11, which was read to us this morning so well and recited by the children, for today in the city of David there's been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You know, the first time I remember that verse was from the, um, the children's special, Charlie Brown Christmas. Do you remember when Linus 
at the end started to read in Luke the story of the birth in Luke. And I actually remember that. And, and of course, you know, that, that was out in the 60s, wasn't it? The first time that was put out. It's been around for a while. For today, a child has been born for you, a Savior, which is Christ the King. Does Christmas really mean that anymore? Do we really understand the significance of that day? Now, I know I get in trouble every time I say this, but you know that Christmas is not when Jesus was born, right? You know that. And you wonder why did God not give us that information? Why might he have withheld the exact time and day of the year? Because, you know, we're, we're pretty cool on birthdays, aren't we? How many of you forget your birthday? And when you do, or you forget somebody else's birthday, you get reminded pretty quickly, don't you? Boy, I mean, that's an, a personal affront if someone were to forget your birthday. But God intentionally did not remind us of that, and I wonder why. Why might he have withheld that information? Could it be possible that he knew that someday we were going to turn Jesus' birth into something that God never intended it to be? That we would take this fantastic, exciting celebration on the birth of the Savior and turn it into some sort of commercial event in which Jesus is lost. And today in our country, put up a nativity scene in a public place and see what happens. See what happens. Have, in fact, I don't know how many of you saw the, uh, it was on Fox News, there was an article about a teacher who put Linus up with the reading that I just mentioned, and the school superintendent told her that that was too religious and she had to take it down for her Christmas decorations. And that just happened within the last week, down in Texas, I believe. So there seems to be this overwhelming attitude or attack on the day of Christ's birth or the celebration of it to remove it and to totally commercialize and secularize this day. I hope we as Christians are not falling into that trap and allowing the trappings of secularism to take away the significance of the beauty and the, the glory of God's love being demonstrated on that particular day. If you remember, a couple of weeks ago, Thanksgiving, when Trish and Carly and I were leading worship, remember we sang a song, and it was called How Many Kings, it was the name of the song. You can go on YouTube and you can watch this, and we actually played a YouTube video of this song, How Many Kings. I want to remind you of the chorus of that song. How many kings step down from their thrones? How many lords have abandoned their homes? How many greats have become the least for me? And how many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that is all torn apart? How many fathers gave up their sons for me? You see, Bethlehem was beginning of the sacrifice of Jesus. We often equate the cross as the sacrifice of Jesus. But do you not think that it was a sacrifice that, co that God himself condescended to be placed in the womb of his creation? And don't you think that the angels were in tears when Jesus said, I'm going to do this? They didn't understand. They couldn't comprehend what he was going to do by being born through the womb of a woman. And even that would have been okay, maybe, if it would have been in a palace. But in a stable with animals and a feed trough? How many kings have laid down their crowns for me? Do we understand the significance of the sacrifice of Jesus to merely be born in Bethlehem in a stable. Well, God gave the greatest gift of love on that day, on Jesus' birthday. We don't even know when it is, but we celebrate it on December 25th. And you know what? I don't have a problem with that. It's okay to pick a date and I know that there's some issues with, you know, pagan holidays, the winter solstice and all this stuff. But you know what? It's one day out of the year in which Christians almost get an ear when we start singing some of the beautiful songs. Did anybody watch 
the Pentatonics Christmas special this week? Did you notice how many Christian hymns were sung in that? 75% of what was being put out on network TV was Christian, blatantly Christian hymns. And people were standing up and applauding. It's the only time of year we get away with that stuff. As Christians, we can stand in the marketplace and say, Jesus was born. I'm okay with Christmas Day. Rightly understood. Rightly applied. But we all, I, I've done it too, get sucked up in the commercialism of the day. And it was good to hear the kids this morning talking about the meaning of Christmas because it is about family. It is about remembering Jesus. It is about not so much the presents, although the world would want us to think that we could not survive if we didn't get a present on Christmas Day. And I want to tell you, you already got one, and his name is Jesus. And if there was no packages to unwrap underneath your tree this year, you already have one, and his name is Jesus. The greatest gift ever given is yours. So you don't have to feel sorry if you don't have a package brightly wrapped. The package God gave was wrapped in swaddling clothes and placed in a manger. And we should rejoice as the angels rejoiced because there was no greater gift ever given. <clears throat> well, remember the story in Matthew, and again, when we get into the history of this and the way that we have condensed the story, the wise men did not show up on the night of Jesus' birth. They didn't. In fact, it was probably months after. If you read the story in Matthew, it said that they showed up at the house where Mary and Joseph were living. Well, I thought he was in a manger. Well, he was, but not now. He's moved to a house. Well, these wise men were pagans. In fact, they were of the religion Zoroastrianism, which was founded in the Babylonian or Mesopotamian country. And they came from the east searching for what the prophets had prophesied. So where did these pagans find out about this prophesied king? How did they understand the, the promises of the Jews, promises to the Jews, that a king would be born in Bethlehem? Well, there was a prophet from northern Beth Mesopotamia who it is alleged, and I can't prove this, but he, it is alleged that he was a follower of Zoroastrianism. And guess what his name was? His name was Balaam. I jumped ahead of myself. In Numbers 24, 16, and 17, Balaam gave a prophecy. He said, The oracle of him who hears the word of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down, yet having his eyes uncomforted, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Judah. A scepter shall arise from Israel and crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down all the sons of Sheth. So an ancestor to the at least the, uh, the modern day, when I talk about modern day at the time of Jesus, the magi or magicians was Balaam. So what was Balaam's connection to the Israelites? Well, he was called to curse them, wasn't he? And when he went, he wasn't allowed to. God said, I'm not going to allow you to curse my people. So he blessed them three times. And so Balaam, in giving this prophecy in Numbers, a prophecy that would have been handed down in his country because he was a respected prophet in Mesopotamia, would have been a clue to these three magi about the prophecy of a star rising in Judah. But there's another one that they could connect it to because the timing is important because stars come up and you know you got all these. What would be something else that these magi would have related to in their culture and in their world and in their understanding that would have drawn them to Bethlehem. How about a prophet who lived in their country by the name of Daniel? And did Daniel interpret visions? He did, didn't he? And do you know that was one of the primary jobs of these Zoroastrian magicians was to interpret dreams? 
Would they have held Daniel in high esteem because Daniel was one of the greatest of dream interpreters? And Daniel prophesied in 925, So you are to know and discern that from the rising of the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Now, for any good Bible student who has studied Daniel 9, the 70-week prophecy, what is it that that 70-week prophecy specifies? The very date in which Jesus would come on the scene. So not only did they have a prophecy from Balaam saying a star will rise in Judah, but they also had a prophecy from another esteemed prophet that they would have had access to, that it would happen at a particular time. And so they were intentionally looking for the coming of the one that was prophesied to these pagans. Did the Israelites have access to these things too? Were they anticipating the day? I wonder if there's a message there that those who handled the scriptures and were looking forward to the king lost sight of it, but God spoke to pagan magicians people that we would consider heretics. And it was these three men, well, we assume it was three because of the three gifts, because that's what the, and, and again, they weren't kings, so when you sing the song, we three kings, they weren't kings, they were magicians. They were affiliated with kings, they would have talked to kings, they would have been advisors to kings, but they were not kings. <clears throat> They knew not the God of Israel, but they brought the newborn king expensive gifts and offerings. Why? Because that's what a king deserves. You bring a king expensive gifts. They knew this was the king. He was prophesied. Gold, incense, and myrrh. So if these pagan kings could bring Jesus gifts on his birthday, and God in a, in a miraculous way, did what on Jesus' birthday? He didn't ask us to bring gifts. He gave us a gift, which is totally countercultural to us. When you have a birthday, you expect people are going to bring you gifts, right? Now, those three gifts that were given by the, the Magi, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, were they, were they practical? Had... Jesus' parents not gotten that, how would they have been able to go down to Egypt and survive? They wouldn't have been able to. Those are practical. And what is it that you anoint a person with in the Old Testament or in the Middle East today? What do you anoint a dead person with? Frankincense and myrrh. So these things had relevance to Jesus' life, ministry, and death. So what did God do for us on his birthday? He gave us his son. What do we do for him on his birthday? Careful now, think about it, think about it. What do we do for him on his birthday? Come to church and sing some songs? Do you see the irony in this? Do you see the irony that God gave us the greatest gift possible on his birthday, and we seemingly don't really understand the magnitude of that. What do we give in return? Does anybody know what the acronym CEO stands for? You're going to be wrong, but what does it stand for? <laughs> yeah. Chief Executive Officer, yeah. Well, that's one way of interpreting it, but I meant it a different way. Christmas and Easter only. And that's what we call Christians who only come to church twice a year, Christmas and Easter. CEOs, Christmas and Easter onlys. So is that our gift to Jesus, that we show up to church once or twice a year? We put in appearance and we say, hey, that's about all you deserve. I got stuff to do. I got plenty on my plate. Think about it. If you really understood the magnitude of the gift that God gave on Jesus' birthday, wouldn't we be compelled to want to give something back to him? Maybe something extraordinary. 
I don't know, just seems odd to me. That on his birthday, we give gifts to each other, but we seem to forget about the king. When pagans bring costly gifts to his side, what are we bringing to Jesus? This is not working very well today. It seems odd to me that we, who have been endowed with the prophecies and given the promise of the grace of God, being blessed by the greatest gift ever, struggle sometimes to understand that God would like us to be a part of his family. That he wants family time with himself. And that he would like us to return a gift to him. And what is the greatest gift that you can give God? Yourself, right? I wonder if Christmas wouldn't be better served if it was a day of rededicating our lives to Jesus Christ. A day in which we stand up and say, you know what, Lord, I had a rough year. I slipped, I fell, I got dirty, I got muddy, but you know what? I'm going to rededicate my life to you because you dedicated your life to me on the birth of your son. I want to dedicate my life to you. Do you think it would stick? Do you think we could make this a movement? I don't know. But I would like to see something special on Jesus' birthday. So this year, and I don't want to make this about money, even though I'm going to take the offering call now, I don't want to make this about money. Because you can give all the money in the world, and it doesn't mean a hoot to God if he doesn't have you. God wants you first and foremost. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make two appeals for the offering today. And we're going to have the deacons stand up, and we're going to take the offering but I'm going to make two appeals. One of them is an appeal for the pocketbook. Because, you know, if you got the pocketbook, you got the rest of the person, that's what they say. I want to ask you to think carefully about the gift that you're going to give to Jesus this year. But more important than that, I'm going to ask that you would rededicate your life to Jesus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send the deacons off to collect, and then I'm going to invite you, as they go past, if you would like to come up here, I'm going to pray a prayer of dedication. So go ahead and take the offering, and as the deacons move through the congregation, if you would like to come forward and rededicate your lives to Jesus today, I'd like to offer that, invite you up. And make sure you don't come up before the offering comes through because that'll screw everything up. Now, I hope you're not doing this for effect. Seriously, if you don't mean it, don't come forward. Don't make promises that you can't keep. That you are going to dedicate your life to Jesus on this Christmas season. That the gift of God is so significant to you that you want to return yourself to him. Can you move up and over a little bit or come up? Because there's people coming down. Look at this. This is good news. And you know what, if, I, if you could, could I get you to kneel with me as we pray? That would be awesome. That's okay. If you can't kneel, stand. That's fine. But where possible. Lord, I want you to take a look at your children this morning. They want to give a gift to you. And Lord, I pray that you're smiling right now. That your heart is just pounding with joy. Because your children want to give a gift to Jesus. 
And Lord, we know that uh, this is a world in which it's difficult to live out our Christian faith. It's difficult to be a faithful follower of Jesus. But you have been faithful to us through some very difficult times. And we can't help but remember and honor and praise you for the way that you have always called us your children and opened your arms to accept us. Lord, we want this year to be different. We want Jesus to come first in our lives. So we are praying today a prayer of dedication on each individual who has stood up, who has walked forward, or even sitting in their pews and, and have said in their hearts, Lord, I want you to be number one in my life. I pray that you would bless them, that you would encourage them and strengthen them and give them wisdom beyond their years. And I pray that you would protect those who have made a stand for Jesus because there's an enemy watching and he has taken names. So Father God, please bless us and thank you. Thank you for this display today as we have stood up for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can go back to your seats. We have a closing song. <clears throat> Praise God. Praise God for his spirit and the response in this place and for that child that he sent so long ago. This is a song that all of you know. It. I find this to be a beautiful uh, arrangement that speaks to me and I'm very happy to have Linda and Karen on the flutes as well. Please join us to sing.
If you have need of special prayer, the elders will be up front by the organ after church. If you would like to come forward and have prayer with them, um, please do so. <clears throat> Father God, thank you for your son, Jesus. And Lord, we truly do need a constant reminder of what a great gift that was that you gave to us in Bethlehem. Lord, give us a new Christmas spirit, a spirit that understands that Christ was love, is love, and will continue to love. Not only does he love us, but he asks us to love him. Bless us as we leave this place, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.